Good morning. Welcome to church this morning as we come together to worship God as a church family. I hope that you're beginning to feel a little bit more of the festive season. We're going to be singing some more carols today and turning and continuing to turn our thoughts towards Christmas. But as we begin and as we continue our Advent themes, today we're thinking about peace. And peace can be a very popular thing to talk about, even post on social media about the dream, about the plan for, but often in life we discover it to be quite an elusive thing. We can be find ourselves asking, where can I find peace? But as we light our Advent candles, it's a testimony of the power of light over darkness. And sometimes we can feel that darkness in our lives as a lack of peace. But the second candle of Advent is our peace candle. And in our search for peace, we're reminded that peace is not found in an idea or a concept, a political theory, or in a place, but that peace is found in a person. And so as we light the candle of peace, we remember how the mighty God has given us the Prince of Peace through the birth of a small child. And as we light this candle, we remember our need for a Savior to save us from sins, to give us peace with God. And that question of peace, it's a very personal thing. And our first praise will actually allude to that, how our peace with God is a very personal thing. But as we begin, I want to read just a couple of verses that speak of this peace. In John 14, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And in Colossians 3, we read this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let's pray as we begin our time together. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And you want to bring your peace into our lives. Father, we want to thank you for caring for us, for promising to give us your peace. And we pray that today you would guard our hearts and minds with your peace. Father, you know us, you know us, you know the worry the anxiety, even the fear that weighs us down that we bring into church today. Father, fix our minds on you instead and bring your peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dorothy's going to come and light our Advent candle. Oh. Click, click it. You're okay. Click it again. There we go. Brilliant. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Just as we stand to sing our first praise, I want to invite you to read these words from Isaiah 9 that speak of the child that we're thinking about today. Can, can I ask you to please stand as we read together Isaiah 9, and then we're going to sing together. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's sing together when peace like a river.
peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Father, just in the silence, we thank you for Jesus and the peace, the peace with you that Jesus brings into our lives and the peace with the situations and circumstances in our lives that Jesus brings into our lives. Father, we thank you for those words that enable us to praise you and thank you, Father, that through Jesus it is indeed well with our soul. Father, we can stand before you clothed in the righteousness and goodness and perfection of Christ. And know, Father, this morning as we sit before you, as we sit with bowed heads, Father, that we are your children, that we are adopted into your family. And Father, as we turn our thoughts towards the Christmas story, no matter what age we are, Father, we pray that you would just once again thrill our hearts with the joy from seeing the wonder of the Christmas story and the peace that that baby in a manger brings. Father, be with us today as we worship you together as your people in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. No, any boys and girls out there this morning who want to come up to the front? Come and join me. Let me get rid of a, some buzzing here. There we go. Brilliant. Don't look so scared, boys. My goodness. Just before you guys head out to Kingdom Kids, you doing okay, guys? Brilliant. How's Peppa this morning, Tilly? Is Peppa okay? Peppa Pig, that is. He has joined us at the front. Brilliant. Now, can anybody tell me how many more sleeps until Christmas Day? Anybody know? Benjamin. Fifteen. Today's the tenth. That is true. I think that's what Eliza said to me this morning. Today's the 10th, 25th, 15 more sleeps. Hands up in the congregation if you're getting excited for Christmas. Brilliant. Holly is brilliant. Excellent. So we should. Christmas is an amazing time of the year. Now, just very quickly before you head out to Kingdom Kids, we're going to continue to think about what Catherine introduced to us last week as we think about the Christmas story. But before we do that, I'm going to test our minds. Now, I'm hoping that the colors on my projector help me out. Now, we're thinking about joining two things. And what you get when you join two things, if you mix blue and red, what do you get? Benjamin, go ahead. Purple. Purple. That kind of looks like purple. That's all right. We'll go with that. Go with that. Now, what's next? Yellow and red. What do you get when you mix... Go ahead. Orange. Orange. Brilliant, William. Last one. Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. What do you think, Tilly? Can, can, you, can you see the, the answer the next one? Can you see the slide? No? Green. Oh, Tilly is on fire. Green. Brilliant. Now, we're thinking about last week. Catherine introduced two words last week, and I tr- want you to think... If we add ordinary and extraordinary, what do we get? There's a bit cryptic, maybe. Catherine was thinking about ordinary characters in the Christmas story and extraordinary events. And I think if you mix ordinary and extraordinary, you get Christmas. That's my thinking anyway. Ordinary characters of the Christmas story, extraordinary events and people, and we get Christmas. And again this morning, I want us to think about the ordinary characters of Christmas and the extraordinary events and characters. So we're going to think about another section of the story, and we're going to listen in and follow the pictures. On the night Jesus was born, shepherds were watching their sheep. And suddenly, an angel stood before them, 
And God's light shone all around. And the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring joyful news to all people. Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born. He is lying in a manger. Then a choir of angels appeared. They sang glory to God in the highest, peace and goodwill to everyone on earth. Well, you can imagine the shepherds were a bit dazed by this, but the shepherds rushed to Bethlehem, and there they found baby Jesus. And they told Mary and Joseph what the angel had said. And as they returned to their sheep that night, the shepherds told everyone what they had seen and heard. All along the way, the shepherds shouted praises to God. So we have our ordinary characters of the Christmas story. Who do you think were the ordinary characters of the story that we've just thought about or I've just read? Benjamin, yeah? The shepherds. Ordinary guys out on the hills looking after their flocks. Just ordinary guys. Who do you think were the extraordinary characters of our Christmas story, William? Yes, but in, that's, in the story that I've just read, there were some other extraordinary characters. Who do you think, Benjamin? Angels. The angels. The angels, the extraordinary characters of our Christmas story. And that is where we find the ordinary and the extraordinary. And there are two things that I want to open up and look at this morning. What is this? What's this look like? What does it kind of look like, Benjamin? A checklist. Because the angels are extraordinary characters. Give the shepherds a checklist. When they went looking for the baby, they had a checklist. Now, how did they get on with their checklist? When they went in and went searching, did they find a baby? Tick. Did they find a feeding box, a manger? Tick. Did they find strips of cloth? Brilliant, Tilly. They did. Tick. The message that the angels gave to the shepherds. They had a checklist. And every single thing that the angels told the shepherds was true. Amazing. The checklist was true. Everything the angels said was true. Now, there was something else that the angels gave to the shepherds this morning. What does that look like? What does it look like? Sweet. Sweet. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. What, what, what is it, Benjamin? An invitation. Brilliant. The angels gave an invitation to the shepherds. Come. Come and see if it's true. The message of a baby being born. Come and discover Jesus. An invitation to go. And that's the same for each of us. We are given this invitation to come and experience the Christmas story, to see, is it true? Is what the angel said was true? And I want to give everyone that invitation to join with the shepherds and experience and investigate and think and discover the ordinary characters of the Christmas story and the extraordinary characters of the Christmas story that tell us just how amazing the birth of this baby is. Guys, you have listened so well, and we're going to sing a song that helps us to continue to think, what are your favorite parts of Christmas? What are your favorite parts of Christmas? Tilly? Presents. Presents, good call. Good answer. Good answer. What, what other are really exciting parts of Christmas that you enjoy? Dinner. Dinner. Thank you, Michael. Presents, food. What else? Congregation. Playing games, Sonia. Oh, playing games, brilliant. Anything else? One more thing. What do we enjoy about Christmas? Crackers. You must have known the song that we're going to sing. Crackers and turkey. 
Christmas is full of lots of good things, but we want to remind ourselves that the Christmas story is all about Jesus. What Christmas means more to me because it's somebody's birthday. Let's stand and sing crackers and turkey. Um, just before Peter does um, the majority of the announcements, I'm going to do two with, um, in relation to PW. So the first is that our PW Christmas meeting is this Tuesday evening at 7.30pm. And if you have never been before, you would be most welcome. We've extended an invite, as we always do, to um, the ladies from our local um, Church of Ireland and Methodist churches and also to the PW groups in Whitehead and Ballycarry. So we're hoping there'll be a few uh, new and different faces there. So if you come along, you've never been before, you'll not stand out because there'll be a few different people there anyway, and you would be so welcome. We're having um, Joanne McFarland from Kids for School along. And at the quiz we had in September, we, we did a little, well, we give donations at that time. So we've got a check to give her for 250 pounds, which is lovely. She's in Tanzania at the minute. So please do pray for her, for the work she's doing there and for safe journeys home for her that she will make it to Isla McGee on Tuesday evening. But we'll have our stall as well. We're gonna be having supper and we're gonna be having Christmas reflections. So please do come along. The other thing to say is a huge thank you. So the pin board that we had up with the Samaritan's Purse gifts, the total value of the gifts that you gave was £853, which is unbelievable. Um, in the service extras, there is a wee breakdown of what that all was, you know, like the blankets and the solar lights and how many of everything. But the total value was £853. It hasn't gone just yet. I, it has gone, Janet says it has gone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, your gifts will be winging their way to people in due time. But thank you. That was an amazing effort. So we're really grateful. Thanks, um, Jackie. Just a couple um, more announcements this afternoon. I've been hearing over the last number of weeks talking about messy church. Really appreciate at least one thing, if not two. Do, um, if you remember this afternoon, do pray for messy church. Um, it's a great opportunity for us, as I've said, to engage with our local community, and we're excited by those who, people who are coming along. So do pray the messy church would be a fun, safe, 
encouraging time together as a church family as we welcome the community. Um, so do remember Messy Church in your prayers this afternoon, but also there's still that invitation to come and to join us. I have no doubt there'll be plenty of craft to do if you want to do some craft, but also lots of opportunity to just spend time together, welcome others, chat with others, enjoy some festive food, but also if you really want your picture taken, you can get your picture taken as well. Um, so do, if you are, would like to join us, you'd be most welcome to join us for a messy church um, this afternoon. It's like you said, um, PW Christmas um, meeting on Tuesday, 7.30 in, in Kilcoan. Just a couple of announcements for Thursday evening that do change things a little bit. Next Sunday evening, we're having our community carols by candlelight. An opportunity for us, again, to invite the community to come and join us as we celebrate Christmas. We'll have different readers from the local community join us. But in preparation for that, at 7 o'clock, um, downstairs in the long room on Thursday night, we're just pulling together people who would like to lead the carols just leading the carols and we're offering open that invitation to anyone if you have other people you know in the local community who would like to come and be a part of that choir um, bring them along and it's literally on Thursday night we'll be running through the well-known carols just to make sure that we know what's happening but the choir that will lead the carols at our community carol service next Sunday evening so seven o'clock downstairs you'll be really welcome because of that Kirk session, we're going to meet downstairs at a quarter to eight. That is a change. Do note that change. So quarter to eight downstairs in the long room. Kirk session, if you come at seven, you get to join the choir. There's an invitation. So that's Thursday night. An invitation to join us next Sunday morning. We're having a, what's called a pop-up nativity service. This is our Christmas family service. The kids will be taking part, um, being part of our nativity. I hope you can see there as well. Come along dressed as a nativity character. Very important three words in brackets. Growing ups too. There's that invitation for everybody. Bring your tinsel halos, your shepherd tea towels, your Christmas jumpers. Come and be a part of our pop-up nativity service. Invite friends, other families that you'd know. Um, this is our Christmas family service next Sunday morning. And then next Sunday evening, our community carols by candlelight here in Kilcoan Church, 7 o'clock, the Christmas story and readings and carols for the whole community. Do It's a great opportunity to invite others to come and be part of our Christmas celebrations um, this year. Thank you for bearing with us. And of course, you're always welcome to join us for refreshments after the service. A, a number of weeks ago, I said that in the coming weeks, we'd be hearing different opportunities that you might choose to avail of in, in giving this Christmas. And as Colin shared last week, we're really aware of the challenges that we all have. Um, it's really encouraging to hear the giving towards the Samaritan gifts. Thank you for that. You may have read in the magazine about one other opportunity, if you so would wish to give. And we, we always support the World Development Appeal, um, the Christmas Appeal, um, through the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. You may have read about it in the magazine. If you didn't, we're going to watch just a short video now that tells us more about what the World Development Appeal is this year. And then I'm going to lead us as we pray about those who will be um, supported through the project. My father was using the land to cultivate. Our chief came to us. He told us that because I am the chief, I own this land. And my father he said, I will not agree to the terms and conditions. And that was how it happened. They collected my father's land forcefully from him. And then I took the decision upon myself that I have to leave this place. I don't want to die like the same way my parents died already. This chiefdom have suffered a lot from a multinational company that is engaged in palm oil plantation. Over 80% of the land has been occupied by this company. As a result, the citizens are fled to neighboring villages and that has affected 
their agricultural activities and their livelihood. And when I came to this village, I'm grateful for the ones that I met because they embraced me well and I've been living with them like we are family members. I'm really grateful to them and I want to appreciate them. It's called the Village Savings and Loan Association. It is an initiative that brings women together so that they can contribute to the box. It's a box like, and they can be able to access loan from that box. So our intervention was really to train those women because it has a whole set of rules and regulations. Where are you joining us? I was one day sitting down when they brought this box and they told me that this box is strictly for the women. And since I desperately wanted to join this VSLA box, I thought to myself that my neighbors are here that are doing this palm, palm fruit reproduction. So I decided to join them. I've been doing that for over a period of time now. That's how I earn money to pay my own contribution and to take care of my children. If my child has a tattered cloth, I'll have money to buy for them and I'll have money to take care of food and all. Some of the enterprises the women are doing right now when they access this loan, some of them are into palm oil businesses, into rice, and some are also into farming and gardening, like cassava gardening, like rice farming, they will do and then they, they, they grow and then sell, and then they're able to contribute and they're able to also reinvest, you know, back into their businesses. But beyond the VSLA um, discussion, we've also trained them to discuss issues around their homes. We also encourage them to have this kind of thing. The VSLA box over there has done a whole lot of work for me, including my children as well, a whole lot. And I'm saying a very big thank you to them for what they have done for me and especially my children as well. As a Christian who believes in Jesus and what he has done, have read about him, you know, have uh, I've been reading the gospel time and again, have read about the work of Jesus Christ, moving with compassion, helping the, 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 the helpless, and giving hope to the hopeless. Before this time, I was a nobody in the community with nothing to get for myself. I'm now able to take up my own responsibility and do so many things on my own. My message to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, first of all, is just to thank them, but also the love and the relationship that they've extended to this part of the world. For me, it's, it's, it's a really a great joy. We would like them to continue to pray for us living here, that peace should regain back in our community, in the villages that are around us. Without your support, we cannot come to these villages, but you've been supporting us, and that's making us to come and to reach the most marginalized community. And together, we will give them the fullness of life. Let's pray together, let's pray. Father, as we consider the Christmas story, we are reminded of your amazing love for us through that story your heart for this world. We are also reminded later on the Christmas story is Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to flee to Egypt. Father, you know what it was to, to be, have to leave your home. And, and Father, we acknowledge that you're a God who loves justice. You hate robbery and wrongdoing. And so as you see the injustice that unfortunately is around this world, Father, you are grieved by it. You grieve for those trapped in slavery or inescapable poverty. You grieve for those who have no place to call home. Father, we pray that you would help us to share your heart for others, 
And this morning, Father, as we reflect on what we've just seen, we want to pray especially for churches in Sierra Leone and in Bangladesh and in other parts of your world where some 108 million people have found themselves displaced from their homes. We pray, Father, that your people would be people of hope, people who can provide those who've been displaced with what they need, a place to belong, land to dwell on, purposeful work to be a part of. And Father, we thank you that in Jesus, your church has all it needs to offer hope to those who have lost everything. Father, may we be a part of that, offering hope to those who find themselves with no hope. Father, you are the God of the distressed. He promises to lift out of the water and set down in wide open places those who look to you. You're the God who created, sustained, and owns the whole of creation. And we pray, Father, that you would come and be at work in your world to restore broken relationships that cause so much injustice. Father, we long for the renewal and restoration of all things through Christ. And Father, we pray that you might move us and lead us to be a part of that through this world development appeal. And as we think of Christmas, of Jesus being born, of you entering this world of God being with us, Father, you know each of us as we come to worship today. Father, we pray that we would be open to invite you to come into our, wor- into our lives and into our worlds to do a work, Father, where we have burdens, to do a work, Father, in our lives when we need to know your love and your grace and your mercy towards us, to do a work in our lives, Father, when we need to know that you are walking with us, journeying with us through life. And so, Father, we pray that as we come to your word in a few moments that you would speak to us, encourage us, and draw us closer to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we turn to God's Word, Jackie's going to come and read to us from Luke chapter 2. If you'd like to turn there, please do. And then after Jackie reads, we're going to stand and sing, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. Thanks, Jackie. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
if you do have your pew Bibles, do maybe turn back to Luke chapter 2, page 1027 of your pew Bible, as we just take some time to continue to think about another um, set of characters in our Christmas story. I, I wonder, have you ever been somewhere during a period of silence? Silence. Maybe an exam room, maybe at a funeral or a remembrance event. There's silence. And then the silence is broken. A sneeze, someone drops something, a mobile phone goes off. The silence is broken. And usually that break of silence comes with a bit of a jolt or a jump for those who are surprised. Look around, what's, what's, what's going on? What has broken the silence? Our characters of Christmas today are instrumental in breaking the silence. As we begin reading the Gospels. It is the angels who break a silence of 400 years as they appear to Zechariah, to Mary, to Joseph, the shepherds and the magi. 400 years without the voice of God. 400 years of no messages or revelation from God. Silence from the Creator speaking to his creation. And here, in the events of the very first Christmas, we find these angelic messengers announcing and preparing the way for the birth of God's Son. Last week, we thought about the unassuming, nearly forgotten character of Joseph. And this week we move to consider the angels who we may not have realized play such a pivotal role. One author writes, you can't tell the Christmas story without the angels. I hadn't really thought about that. You can't tell a Christmas story without the angels. If you take the angels out of every other character's story, there's a big gap left. But who are the angels? What is an angel? The angel on the top of your Christmas tree may be the closest that we maybe come to, to knowing about angels. There's a lot of mystery that surrounds them. They are spirits, the Bible tells us, who at times dawn human form. They seem to have supernatural power. They do not die. We're told in Colossians 1 that they are created by and for Christ. The writer of Hebrews, t Hebrews tells us that they cannot be numbered. And we may know of Lucifer, the devil, being a fallen angel. And angels have been around from before the creation of the world. And when we think about that last point, they have had a unique privilege of being able to observe God's entire plans and purposes from creation throughout the Old Testament, all the ups and the downs, all the disappointments in God's people, along with the lives of God's faithful followers, they have watched over it all. And as we encounter angels throughout the Bible, we find that they are advocates, they protect, they make war, they teach, they comfort, they guide, and their greatest role and primary role is that of worshiping God. And here in the Christmas story, they act as their name describes them. They are messengers, messengers from God. They are summoned by God, sent to break into the silence. Firstly, Gabriel. And then as the stories go on, we then come to the, the great company of the heavenly host of the shepherds, to announce the birth of a very special baby boy. But I wonder for you today, do you have ears to hear this message from God through the angels? This message that breaks 400 years of silence. Well, I think it's worth 
listening to. And the challenge for us this Christmas, which I think nearly every Christmas, is to listen to these most familiar of stories, to listen to them with open hearts and minds, with open ears, for what God is saying, what God is revealing. Because these amazing events come with revelation, specific messages from God that we need to hear. And so maybe as we sit through nativities, as we go to carol services in the coming days, my prayer is that we would grasp like the angels knew the wonder of what was happening. That all of history has been funneling towards this moment, as Galatians tells us, when the right time came, God sent his son. Everything we read here is God's perfect timing for a baby born in a small village in Israel. At that time, few knew, few cared, but the angel message was clear. Something truly amazing had happened. The great mystery of our faith, Christ revealed in a human body, Emmanuel, God with us. This was the message. And Charles Wesley, as we sang the last carol has already appealed to us. Hark, hark, hear, bend our ears, hear what these heavenly messengers have to say. Words that bring challenge, encouragement, words to strengthen our faith today. The opening verses of Luke's gospel remind us afresh of the veracity of what we read here, the truthfulness of what we read here in Luke chapter 2. In many ways, these are unbelievable events in our modern sectoral, secular society. And maybe in some ways, maybe unbelievable events in our own hearts and minds. Angels appearing to shepherds on a hillside, bringing a, a message from God, displaying the glory of the Lord all around. These are not every day events, and in some ways even unbelievable. But that is not how Luke approaches them. If you flick back, if you've got your Bibles open and you flick back to Luke chapter 1, he begins his gospel with these words. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, servants of the Word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This account on the hillside comes from eyewitnesses, from conversations with the shepherds, and it comes bringing a confidence to the like, Philophilus, we may be certain of the truth, the quite amazing truth of what we read. A little bit of confession time. I think it's okay, just to reassure you, I think it's okay to admit that maybe over the last couple of weeks you have enjoyed seeing the Christmas lights go up. The decorations go up in houses around you. On Friday night, Ethan and I purposely pulled off a main road in Carrick to check out a very brightly lit cul-de-sac. Lights and trees, lights around front doors, lit up reindeers, snowmen, Santas, the occasional Merry Christmas sign illuminated on the side of a house. In some cases, I think a guaranteed higher electricity bill come January. But if you asked someone what the message of Christmas was as they observed the lights, the decorations on our houses, in our shopping centers, in our homes, they would probably come back with mixed messages of what the story, the true message of Christmas is. And the occasional star that you see might not be enough to point people towards the true meaning of Christmas that we find on the lips of the angel here in Luke 2. 
Because in Luke 2, in verse 10, the angel says this. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Christmas is good news of great joy. No wonder does this good news of great joy get lost in our lives at Christmas time? Do we make time to be reminded of this good news? Good news that is not abstract from us or elusive from us, but good news that personally touches our lives. But I wonder, we can fall into the trap of just the pressure of present buying, the busyness of the season, the preparations that we all often need to make the Christmas parties, the family get-togethers, all that we thought about a little bit earlier with the kids, even the busyness of church events and ministry. Do those things distract us from the good news, remembering, being reminded of the good news? Or on the flip side of that, do we miss that Christmas is good news of great joy because of the challenges that we're going through, the changed days that we're going through, the loved ones that we're missing, the loneliness that we might be experiencing? Do those things mean that we miss hearing the angel's announcement, good news of great joy? The heart of the Christmas story is good news. It's the gospel. Christmas should draw us into a deeper understanding, deeper connection with the gospel. And if it's not doing that, if Christmas is not drawing us back to the good news of Jesus, then Maybe we need to pause and remember. The Christmas story is definitely not just a story for children. The heart, the gospel at the heart of the Christmas story is for everyone, the whole world, for all peoples, for you. One author that I've maybe quoted before about writes about how in our lives we don't move on from the gospel. We don't move on from the good news of Jesus. It isn't just about that moment of conversion. The gospel is something that we need day in, day out. And the good news of Jesus that we find in the Christmas story reminds us of our need for a savior. It reminds us of the depth of our sin. It shows us the lengths that God has gone in order to save us and adopt us into his family. And when we remind ourselves of that good news, well, it draws us closer to Jesus in gratitude, in humility, in love for him. And our daily reflection on our daily reliance in that good news is what spurs us on to serve Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to love others, to flee pride and to flee sin. And without that gospel, without the good news of Christmas, we can be distracted from what God is doing around us and doing what he wants to do in our lives. And in what we might call this noisy season, I wonder might there be the need for silence in our life? And a lack of silence is something I am certainly guilty of. But a silence in our lives into which, just like that first Christmas, God can speak into. A silence into which God can speak into. There's a fourth century Advent hymn that says this, Let all mortal flesh keep silence. And with fear and trembling stand, ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descending, comes our homage to demand. I wonder this Christmas how we might 
find silence in this festive season, to consider the good news of great joy that these angels speak of, good news that is for you, each and every one of us, good news that touches our lives and our hearts at our very deepest level. I don't know if you have noticed over the last years that the announcement of the expected birth of a baby has taken a whole new lease of life. I wonder, have you heard of gender reveal parties? Have you heard of gender reveal parties? They're pretty much what they say, a party where you gather family and friends together to reveal the sex of the baby in some fancy way. It can involve colored balloons, dry paint, games, you name it. It has been done. Of course, we still have the picture of the baby scan on Facebook or Instagram. We still do that. But no matter how much planning goes into any baby announcement, nothing comes close to the angel in the sky or the great company of the heavenly host praising God. But this amazing event on the hillside isn't the only thing that's going on. It's an amazing event accompanied by some amazing revelation. God's announcement of the birth of a baby. And the identity of this baby is unique in many ways, and it's at the very heart of the good news of Christmas. And it's an identity that is fitting with an angelic announcement. The angel said, today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And it's the only place in the Gospels that we find this threefold identity of Jesus, saviour, Messiah, Lord. And if we hadn't worked it out already, this is no ordinary baby, but an extraordinary baby. The baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, is God's rescuer. He is God's saviour. Jesus' name means God is salvation. And here in this manger is God's saviour. He has come to save his people from their sins. God, in the person of his son, has come to bring salvation. To bring restoration of humanity's relationship with God. If there was no baby... There would be no salvation and no relationship with God. The baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger is God's saviour, but is also God's Messiah. Jesus is the Christ, the one promised in the Old Testament, the baby born to be the fulfillment of all God's plans and purposes, the one spoken about again and again throughout the Old Testament. This is the one that Israel was waiting for. But when he came... So many didn't see him. The baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, is firstly God's saviour, secondly, the Messiah, and thirdly, Lord. And to finish it off, we have the most staggering of truths that this baby is God. He's the maker of all, he's the ruler of all. It is God come close, Emmanuel. And this identity that the angel brings of this baby speaks afresh of the wonder of Christmas and what this baby came to do. If we think again of the character of the characters of Christmas and Nativity plays and ask who we might want to be, an angel is a pretty good part. Who wouldn't want to be an angel? However, as we delve a little closer, as we think a little bit more about that, one author writes this. How we all would like to have been there, to be a fly on the ear of one of the shepherd's sheep. But actually, though the choir in heaven played a major role, we on earth have the best part because we are the ones who receive God's grace. God became a man 
not an angel. God redeems us, not angels. Ours is the best part. And we will praise God for it for all eternity. This good news of Christmas is how God touches our lives with amazing grace. It's good news that reminds us just how much God loves us. It's good news that spurs us on to walk by faith in the Christ child who would one day die for us. And it is good news for me and good news for you today. My prayer is that we would have ears to hear, open hearts to receive not only this amazing announcement, but to accept the one who it speaks of, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, that is my prayer for each of us today, that we would have ears to hear, open hearts and minds to accept the good news of great joy that the angels declared on a hillside to those shepherds. And Father, over these coming weeks, as we hear the Christmas story, as we watch it in nativities, as we hear it, listen to it in song and read it in the pages of Scripture, Father, may it come alive to us. May we see its personal connection to each of us that Jesus came, was born in a stable to one day die on a cross for us, to be our Savior, because He is the Messiah and He is God. Father, may those truths fill our hearts and our lives with joy this Christmas in the midst of our busyness. Lift our hearts now as we sing your praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing joy to the world. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Let's say the grace and bless each other as we part now. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.